Hello and welcome to the Virtue Cafe. I'm your host, Shagulala Salami, and this is the Shagulala Salami Show. Who have I got here? Leslie Nolan. Hi, Leslie. And Keisha Keith. Hi, Keisha. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. You know, I'm in a... How will I put it? You know one of those days where you're just like really happy and it's like you have this burst of good, you know, good hormones all over your brain cells, circulating through <laughs> your bloodstream, and you're just high, like natural high. Yeah. Love it. That's how I give me and I think also because the sun is out in London. It is May and the sun <laughs> is out. <laughs> Seriously. Go get your no, vitamin D. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is sunshine. Do you know how long we've been looking forward to sunshine and we finally oh. get Sunshine. Yeah, and everybody's happy, I'm sure. Yes, so that's why I'm quite high now. I think I'm high as a kite. That's nice. Yes, that's an awesome feeling. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I don't do drugs, <laughs> so I'm just like natural. Right? And being high off of life is the best high in the world to me, so I, I can understand that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So tell me about yourself, Keisha, because this is the first time in my cafe. Yes, and I, I'm so excited to be here um, and to have this opportunity. Once again, I said um, before, my name is Keisha Keith. Um, I am a licensed professional counselor, so I provide uh, mental health counseling services uh, to various clients. I'm a military spouse, um, a mother, and so that means that I, I've you know, traveled a little bit and I come in contact with a lot of people. Uh, Throughout my journey, I've experienced some, some highs and some lows, but they have all created and brought me to the space where I am today. And so I'm excited about that. Um, and I am also a new author. Uh, I've self-published um, my book called The Classroom of My Life. And, and it talks about my personal spiritual journey um, in dealing with postpartum depression. Um, and that actually landed me... Uh, in, in the psychiatric ward uh, for, oh, wow. for a while. And so it, it really was a, an educational and an enlightening experience for me because I was going through uh, finishing up my um, graduate school program. Uh, and at the same time, I was going through the experiences that a lot of my clients would, you know, go through uh, as a result. So it, I feel like it has, it has blessed me um, and afforded me the opportunity to be able to to share and understand. And, and we walk in different shoes, but understanding the steps that we take um, is important. And I think my life journey has, has given that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, just to, just to, before I even say anything, you know, I've been staring at your pearl and I just have to admire it. <laughs> Well, thank you. I am a fan of pearls, and, and I, I like that particular <laughs> set um, for sure. Uh, every chance I get, I try to put those on. <laughs> very, very lush. I really do like that. I don't have, I think I have pearls once, but it's just something that when I was in, uh, when I was at university, I always see people with pearls, and I think, oh, they're very glamorous and very classy. And so every time I just see pearls now, I just stare at them so much, and it's like, it was just, it was just mm. mesmerizing my eyes. It was capt captivating my eyes. Yes. Well, thank you. Cool. So, Leslie, what about you? What do you do? So, <clears throat> I have had 32 years in graphics and marketing. And my last six years, I am now focusing on working with creative entrepreneurs who have lost their mojo and inspirational vision. And I help them reclaim their power so that they can find the courage to create their great work. Cool. Can you just explain that a bit, please? Because I think you've lost me. Um, what I would like to explain about it is it's through the magic of painting. So okay. usually creative entrepreneurs can tend to speak a different language. They might be very visual. And so if they are, um, you know, going through an emotional time, sometimes it's even difficult to put in words. You know, you might have lots of feelings and it's difficult to take all those feelings and be able to express them. 
So I use a very um, beautiful and unusual painting methodology to ha help people go inside and we get images and messages internally and we paint them out as a way to self-express, find direction, and help us in our work in the world. So an example would be some of my students, for one example, Maria, she um, had gone through a divorce. She was doing some of my workshops and she chose to do a private mentorship with me. And um, in the painting process, she started to unblock some fears that she had. Some, some old stuff was holding her back. At the time, she was working at Target because she needed her health benefits about 80% of the time, but her real love was doing yoga and healing work, and she was doing that about 20% on the side. After the first painting mentorship, she then went 60% at Target, then 40 and then the next, we did a beautiful uh, painting workshop together, and she really stepped into her power and by the next um, painting she did with me, she was 80% in her yoga practice, 20% at Target. And I'm very pleased to say that a month ago, she's quit Target. She's 100% on her own, doing her own retreats and mentorships and group classes. So I'm very proud of her. So for Maria the painting methodology was a way for her to access information in order for her to create her great work. Another example would be my student Flo, who was a retired executive in her late 60s. She did really well for herself and she started taking painting with me and she kept painting and painting and painting and painting. And last fall, I helped her hang her retrospective of 30 of her own gorgeous paintings which she sold, and now she's showing her work in New York and New Jersey galleries. So you could see that the methodology is very empowering for both of these ladies, but they use it in different ways. Mm, mm, interesting, interesting. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna come back to you, um, Leslie, because I definitely am interested in the work that you do, but then it's kind of like I'm also interested in the, in the work that um, Keisha does. Um, so it's kind of like, who do I start with? Okay, Keisha, so you're an author. Tell me about your book, please. So my book is talking about, like I was saying before, the, um, the experiences that I had with postpartum depression. And yeah. in, in that sense, um, all of the, the physical things that I was going through, uh, I pretty much knew them from, you know, my coursework in grad school, but it all pretty much caught me by surprise because, uh, I was, I was really checked out. I was checked out on, on my own personal self-care and being in tune with what was going on with me. Um, because at that particular time, at the time of my, my son's birth, um, we had an emergency C-section. And so because of that, um, it, it was a result of his heart rate dropping. And when his heart rate dropped, um, the doctor gave my husband and I, you know, a, an option to, you know, wait a few hours and see how things go or go ahead and have this C-section. And so um, we looked at each other and then I was like, well, yeah, let's go. Let's, let's go have this C-section. Um, and so Throughout, through that process, uh, our son was born, but of course you wait on that magical cry because of course on, you know, different um, birthing stories and things you hear and you see, you know, the responses and the reactions um, of the infant as it, as it comes into the world. And so uh, we didn't hear that. And that event sparked a lot of different e emotions. Um, for really for us both, but but in my case, I really was um, internalizing a lot of it, and so it it started to to really show once my son was able to come home from the hospital, because like he was one of the he was the largest baby in the NICU at that particular time, um, as a result of of that whole process, and so I really was not 
the the awareness and the the being in those moments and and expressing that emotion um it really was not there for me yet and it really um continued to build up because then i became really anxious because i would of course once he got home go by his bassinet i would check to make sure he's breathing check to make sure everything is you know okay with him and so it just really uh took a toll on me um emotionally but you know my whole pro thought process of you know going to grad school you know becoming becoming a counselor i was i was going to help all of these people but you know these these people became me and and i you know i was that person who had experienced pretty much that traumatic event and that event had sparked and spiraled me into um pretty much a, a psychotic break as you were um and so it it really by book details a lot of the spiritual journey that i went through because i really had to uh rely on, on god and all the spirituality um that i knew to be able to do the things that were necessary to become whole and to, to cope and to identify and, and to create that balance in life for myself. Okay, fabulous. So now you mentioned that you self-published your book. Yes. Did you design the book cover yourself um, or did you get someone to do it? Someone actually did it, but I described everything that I um, wanted. The so book what sort of things, sorry, go on. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to ask, what sort of things um, would you want to see in the book cover? Well, because I was <clears throat> learning some life lessons um, in the midst of being a student, uh, my, my title, I wanted it to speak on my cover. So mm. I wanted there to be a student there um, sitting in the classroom, kind of in the dark, because at that in those at those moments I was feeling my way so I wanted that student to kind of be in the dark but the light to really be flashing and shown on that that chalkboard within the classroom because that that was that was life and that was life playing um for that student and teaching that student a lot of things that that she needed to know and of course that student was me so um, I just des I described that in detail uh, with my designer and they were able to from that um, produce the cover for my book okay and so okay but I'll come back to you in a second Leslie yes as a, as a graphic designer you know you've listened to um, Keisha's um, description of her book and how I think it's very important you know topic because you know there are moms all over the world and you know postpartum depression in fact a lot of the postpartum quote unquote you know um effects is not something that people tend to discuss a lot and i think postpartum depression is one of those really important ones you know because people automatically think that when they hand you your baby you know you're automatically feeling you know filled with love and just you know singing rainbows and being like a unicorn so mm -hmm. if someone comes to you and has this book that's talking on this topic you know yes the author wants it because you know it's a personal journey it's personal to them and they want to be happy to you know with it well you know for me i think that a book a blog a website that nobody reads is a diary right so you know and people still as much as we say don't judge a book by its cover people sadly still judge a book still judge books by their covers. Mm -hmm. So when somebody, you know, like Kishu is explaining to you her book, how would you try and put, you know, the emotions that she's feeling into the book cover so that when someone is glancing, you know, um, a bookshelf and, you know, they might give each book, you know, the 10, what am I saying? They might give each book a two second glance. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that it captures the interest of a potential reader? Well, that's an excellent question. So the first thing is uh, really listening deeply to Keisha's story. Because as she's telling her story, you know, I think to myself, what, what, what would have that been like for me? 
So um, I am a mom, but mm. I have adopted my son. So I didn't go through all of the physical, hormonal um, and stress on the body and the mind and the spirit of my body, though I was pulled in, in different ways. I think about Keisha and her story and how you had to deal with hormones and and worry and anxiety and all those emotions. So I, I get the sense that it's a very emotional experience. So I would then start to ask Keisha some questions as a designer. It would be either I would want to read an excerpt of her book or read her book because I would like to get a sense of her journey and how she came out of it and what her ultimate um, message is at the end of this spiritual, emotional, physical journey that she had through this process. So I may also ask frequently, you know, the authors of the books have an image or a symbol. Sometimes it's a symbol that might be something as simple as a rose. You know, if their book is about, you know, love, um, or there might be some symbol that she may have uh, grasped on in her writing and I might explore that with her or she might have a very specific idea of what she would like on her book cover so I would explore some of those themes with her first and then I might suggest some other ones by reading through the book might be something that um, might be an analogy to some wording that she had and how she phrased a paragraph. So it might be, are we really talking about, you know, this journey of depression and the light of hope coming from it at the end? So I'd see what she wanted to highlight in there. And that could be done in so many ways. So then the next uh, thought would be, once we got to the symbol or the image that we wanted for the cover, is how to convey that idea. Are we doing it in photography? Are we doing that in some kind of illustration? Is there some kind of portraiture involved with Keisha? Uh, so we might explore some of those themes. And then, of course, the title of the book is very important. The words, how you word something with your image, and then the fonts, of course, that are used. So there's so many different fonts that have so many types of flavors and how you're using the spacing and the elements of the photography or the image or the piece of art with the fonts and the layouts. These are all the things that convey the emotion, the emotion that's in the book and the message that the author wants to bring out. Do you know, you said something that I found, you know, truly amazing that none of the um, graphic designers that I've worked with have ever done. You said that you would probably read the book or read, you know, a short part of it. Is that, is that common or is it just that or the graphic designers I've worked with have just been lazy? Well, you know, it depends on the client. So I have worked in some different capacities. So one of the last books that I helped an author with, um, I did all the graphics for the insides of the book. So ah. I laid the book out and I edited it 50 million times. So I was very familiar with the story. And, you know, um, yeah. she self published, but that publishing company, part of their fee was to design the actual book cover. But yeah. I helped her with the colors, the theme, the images, in a sense, as an art director to direct it with the text and the copy and helped her make the selection. So I think it's important. If you're a graphic designer working in a publishing house, you are shackled to your computer and you are just trying to knock out the work because you might have a few books going through production. And in a sense, if you're working on the inside pages, then you would know basically the content. You know, you would get a sense of the content of what's going on inside of the book. But if you're not doing that, you need to have some kind of excerpt. If you're just do, doing the cover design, you have to have some kind of expert excerpt to know the content of the book. Unless you're a big publishing company and you have some kind of formula, yeah. I don't see how you could do it without knowing what is the content. Mm -hmm. I think it's imperative. 
that's interesting. But then again, possibly I have, um, let me see, what's the right word I'm looking for? Uh, maybe I'm a bit of a control freak. And the graphic designers that I've worked with, I've literally told them almost word for word or, you know, sort of illustration by illustration what exactly it is that I am looking for and what it is that I need. Um, and I've not really had much... Much, I don't think I've given much uh, the graphic designers much chance to say, well, here's a suggestion. I'm like, you should can get creative freedom. You know, you draw it and I'll tell you, but it has to be quite specific. But then again, I guess my books are, because most of my books are children's books, so mm -hmm. they don't really, they're more sort of more to be visually appealing than adult books, which, you know, the cover just needs to speak to them or speak, you know, speak to the reader. Yes. And I could see that because many authors know their content and I find many authors are highly visual. Some are not, you know, some paint with words, some do not, they're more um, logical. You know, I've ha had to do some covers for, uh, I believe it was the um, IEEE, which is an engineering company. And it was very, you know, there was like graphs. It was something mathematical. I can't even remember the, the um, name of the book. It was something computational. So in yeah. that regard, I did not read the book. I probably would not even understand the book. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, it, they are publishers. So they need the more artistic end of how to take this very dry data mm. and make it fun and lively. So in that case, I'm not reading the book. I'm giving some um, direction by given, I was given a very, very boring looking graph. And I had to make it really graphic and fun. You know? Yeah. So I think that each assignment is somewhat different. And it also depends on, you know, am I working with the author directly? Or am I working with a large publishing house? Because everybody has a different way of doing things. Mm, mm, mm. and how much direction how much direction do they need so a first time author has never done it before they need a lot of direction a publishing mm -hmm. house or someone who has a lot of experience they might be directing the process yeah yeah, yeah. does cost also to, um, influence the quality of the work that you would um, produce I mean I think everybody has a different budget right Mm, mm. everyone has a different budget so you try to you try to solve their problems within their budget if it makes sense to you both you know yeah um yeah. Sure. sometimes a graphic designer but you know you wear books are heavily illustrated so i happen to have illustration and painting skills not all designers have illustration and painting skills so sometimes somebody might come to me to illustrate and design their book. Some designers take the illustration mm -hmm. that's already done with a copy and design the book. So there's yeah. so many different aspects to it, really. Mm -hmm. that, sound, that sounds quite, quite interesting. So what would you, um, Leslie, tell an aspiring author or first time author who's really excited just finished your first book and they're telling you all these things of what they think because again when somebody has never done something before you know and okay before i even said that there are different types of knowledge so there's knowledge you know that you know there is knowledge you know that you don't know and there is knowledge you don't know that you don't know <laughs> right yeah. <laughs> yeah. does that make sense yes yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now imagine someone who's never done something before and has this idea, right, of what they think. Now, because they've never been in that industry before, they've never done anything before, and they got inspired by something or someone to say, you know what, let me write my book down, and they finish, and they're very invested emotionally in it, and they come into you, and they're telling you all these things, which in your professional experience as a, as a graphic designer is probably very unrealistic right <laughs> so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so what would you you know what sort of things would you be hoping that first time authors knew especially like when someone has done exactly the same thing you know as Keisha and has written and a, a truly amazing book a very emotive book and they're coming to you and they're telling you all these things which are completely undoable or maybe unnecessary or would not be it would be wrong for their book 
Like, what sort of things would you do you wish that, you know, authors knew? Well, you know, there's lots of expectations. They don't understand the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember yeah. when I was deeply, deeply into publishing, sometimes there's, in a publishing house, there's, I believe it was 12 people with different titles mm -hmm. that would help to put a book together. So now with self-published authors, the designer, the author, everybody's wearing many hats. Yeah. So yeah. you really do, for first-time authors, have to educate them on the process. Mm -hmm. That's imperative. And um, I'm laughing as you're talking because I remember Carla with her book, she had it all written. She probably edited it three or four times. She had it all in, uh, it was like Microsoft Word, and she, um, you know, three hole punched it, and she had it in a binder for me to see. And I forget what the pricing was. It was many years ago of what I would charge her just for laying out, designing the book and laying it out. And she looked at me, she said, but it's already done. I said, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> And she said, it's right here. It's already done. This is it. And I had to look at her like she really didn't know. I said, yeah. no, you don't understand. This is a raw material. Like this is an egg. Right. So we're going to take the flour and everything and put it together. They really don't know. She's mm -hmm. like, but I don't understand what you're going to do. So I'd have to explain to her that I'm flowing her text mm -hmm. into a page design program. Yeah to set up the copy and the fonts. And I tried to explain it in detail by showing her. And really, quite honestly, you don't understand it until you do it yourself, yeah. right? So, and, that's and then even a, by the time I did it, she still was editing the book. It was driving her crazy. She would look at me and she would say, I can't look at this one more time. <laughs> And she probably looked at it 20 more times. <laughs> yes. I'm glad you guys are laughing because you just, you don't realize how much work is involved in this sort of thing. Yeah. You know, so I've just written, I've just written my first ebook that I'd like to offer your folks. And I have to say, I was just saying to my friend here, who's allowing me to use her equipment is I said, I feel like it's so lame because ebooks have like a different methodology. They're like, nine or 12 pages. It's very heavy on graphics. You know, it's giving a short message. I'm used to either big tombs or like projects that last half a year. <laughs> and yeah. this, these eBooks, you know, they're more fun and that's informational and it's directing the reader to connect to you if they want to. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a completely different process. Right. And uh, my little eBook that I made is, it's uh, the Creative Entrepreneur's Guide to Get Your Mojo Back. Mm. So if anybody would like one, I'd love to send them it. Yeah. So how do they get it? Would that be on your website? Uh, they can uh, write to me because I'm still in my editing phase at Leslie at LeslieNolanDesign.com. Mm -hmm. Leslie at LeslieNolanDesign.com. Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, so Keisha, you've had every single thing that um, <laughs> Leslie has said, you know, about you know the her, you know, what the stages she goes through when she's um, you know designing a book. What so based on your experience, because your experience now, what would you, what do you wish you knew before, before you started, you know, uh, on your publishing journey and getting your book cover sorted? Um. Primarily everything that Leslie said, uh, pr pretty much because um, <laughs> because it it is it's a it's a labor of love um, to write, and when it is uh, so personal to me, um, or I think to anyone, uh, you you want it to um, you know you want delivery to be well, you want um, you know graphics to to look nice so that it catches you know, the potential reader's eye, um, you, you, I wanted to make sure or hopefully that there was, you know, a message that anyone could, could get out of it, whether, you know, it was a, um, a, a man or a woman reading it. Um, and, it and it really, for me, I, I looked at it and I looked at it and I, I looked at the edits and I 
you know, I had to go back and take a step back, really, um, to, to kind of regroup. Because, you know, at points, it's almost like, okay, so do I really want to do this? Or can I just be, you know, glad with if I share this with a, with a, you know, with a client or if I share this with a family member. But um, at the end of the day, I still had that drive and that push and that motivation that some, someone else needed to hear this um, beyond those people. And, and so because of that, um, you know, I, I stayed the course. But, but of course, you know, what Leslie is speaking about, you know, getting to um, having a, a, a true understanding, a true feel for the book. Uh, and that's important because my, my love for it and, and my, what, I, what I know that it is for me and what I hope that it will be for others, um, the, the designers may not have that. You know, because this is not their work. And, and true, they have, you know, other books that they are working on and, and different things that are going on. And they're trying to, you know, get it out, um, meeting deadlines and things like that. Wherein um, I, I need to make sure that, okay, this is, this is almost like, like my child here um, in some senses. Because this, this was, you know, this was birthed from me and from from the experiences and from the ideas and from the enlightenment and, and awakening experiences. So it, it really had mm -hmm. to be something that I felt like, okay, yes, this, this really does represent me. Um, and thankfully, uh, you know, the design team um, and the editors, they were, they were more than, than willing to, you know, discuss various things with me and for me to express some of my ideas and some of my, you know, concerns about some things maybe that they wanted to change um, or, or, you know, recommended that I change um, within the book. And so I made sure that, you know, that my, I guess you could say the pureness was not lost in, in the whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Sorry, this might sound really, really bad, but I don't mean it in a really bad way. But, you know, as I was just there, you know, staring out the window, I was just thinking to myself, you know what? Yes, it's a virtual cafe, but we don't need a hot drink today. We need a <laughs> watermelon and crushed ice drink. Oh, oh yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah. That was what I was thinking. That was what I was thinking. Would you guys like some virtual watermelon and crushed ice cream? Oh, yeah. And put a little tequila. It's almost 12, and I'm on holiday. <laughs> Fabulous. And it's, it's, gone past, it's gone past 4 o'clock here. What's the time where you are, Keisha? It is uh, 10.13 in the morning. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. So, yes, we can have that. <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> it was just grabbing my eyes. I was just sitting down and I just kept, I couldn't help just look out the window and I was thinking, I've got watermelon in the fridge. Mm. I've got ice in my freezer. I've got a smoothie maker, which I just use as a blender for everything. Uh-huh. That yeah. sounds good. I'm going to tell Sophia. Maybe we'll have that when she stops working this afternoon too. Oh yeah. yeah. We'll go make one. Yes. Yeah, first eyes, first eyes. And then some watermelon in it. And, you know, that's, that's an excess of water. Watermelon is, what, how many percent water? You know, so mm -hmm. if you put a yeah. shot of anything inside, you know, no one's counting because you're having loads of, how many liquids, um, liters of water do you say? It's like two liters. So watermelon, that's part, that's like a quarter of your, your recommended <laughs> volume of water. So, yeah, it's, it's just, I'm just thinking about that. Sorry, yeah, I, I wasn't thinking you made were cool. Cool. but the sun, the sun, the sun just drags my eye. <laughs> and that drink idea made me feel really cool so um I, I think I'll definitely have to take that um offer for sure because yes I'm definitely like, oh, yeah, okay I'll be refreshed <laughs> right about now mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. fabulous but it's been absolutely amazing having you guys um you know on the show and I definitely think I've learned I've learned something um new today um I'm just trying to think, do I write emotive books? And, you know, to be honest, kudos for writing on postpartum depression, because I know a lot of times, you know, people say, oh, yes, when they hand you over your baby, you know, you start, you're supposed to be filled with love instantaneously. I mean, 
instantaneously. It took time for it to grow. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and this is going to sound really bad, but I know it's not. I remember when my daughter was a few months old, right, and she was just crying for no reason, right? And in my head, see, a lot of things, you know, we compartmentalize a lot of things. And in my head, I was just screaming, shut up, shut up. Why yeah. are you crying? There is no reason for you to be crying. You are yeah. fed. You've got clean canvas. What the blooming hell are you crying for? All of this, obviously, was in my mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I would say don't feel bad about that because that, that's a real experience and a real emotion. Um, and, and you're not alone in that. Mm -hmm. There, there are, are, I would say, thousands, if not millions, um, of women who have experienced that same, very same thing. And, and, you know, because, you know, a colicky baby, uh, it, it, it helped, it drives you. You're like, okay, God, I need some patience here. But this <laughs> is doing too much right now. And so you, you, I mean, it's a real, it's a real event and a real emotion. So I can definitely understand that and definitely relate to what you're saying. Yeah. But Leslie, though, just if you don't mind me asking, what was it like? What were your emotions? Like, I mean, I can imagine you love your child, but, um, you know, without your body being, how do I like to put it, being deconstructed and reconstructed? Yes. How, how did your emotions develop? Well, it was kind of interesting because, um, well, I married late at 46, and I thought I'd be like my grandmother and be able to pump out eight kids, you know? <laughs> but that was not in the cards. Like, I thought, oh, when I decide finally to have a child, that'll just happen. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was first the prior emotions of realizing that my time was over. Like it was a very slow dawning. I tried a few different things and I wanted to do things naturally. So, you know, there's a lot of all emotions around that in your body feeling like, oh, you're aging now. And, um, you know, you're in, you know, you're perimenopausal. <laughs> and so there's, you know, that emotions and that body feeling. And then, so there's an acceptance then having to accept your situation mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out what you're going to do because mm -hmm. there are different options. Yeah. Um, and I think I tried some natural herbs. I wanted to try things naturally. And um, even the medicines that they give you to pump up your hormones were not working for me. And I thought even the simple beginning attempts were quite painful. And I knew that, um, based on the statistics that probably wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, carry a child to term. And I know myself that if I would have gotten pregnant and been a, not been able to carry a child to term, to term, that I would go through a deep depression. Mm. Like, and, and messing with my hormones is not a good thing to do. Mm. So, so once we decided to, um, you know, work with child care services, which is, you know, a local program, mm -hmm. it's more known as DIFAS or child care services. We did the training and then it was kind of a waiting thing. We, you know, we heard that in the state of New Jersey, there's 14,000 children that need a home. Isn't that a crazy oh. statistic? Yeah. I have never heard that in all of my life. Mm. So I was a little bit floored by that. So they said, what happens is you get put on a list once you have your license and then you're waiting. Now we only wanted to adopt we weren't interesting in fostering, but in the program, you have to foster to adopt. So, I mean, this is a, like a whole other conversation because we waited basically for quite a while. It almost took us, let's see, my son came to me at 20. So we started this in 2010. It wasn't almost until like another, I don't know. Six months was the first phone call mm -hmm. and was an appropriate situation. Mm -hmm. They wanted to drop a two and a four year old to our house for two weeks over 4th of July weekend. Mm -hmm. And I was planning a workshop and I'm like, no, like it didn't make any sense to me. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I really wanted a young child, a healthy child. I didn't care about the sex or the race. I just wanted a healthy youngest 
um, age child that was possible. Mm -hmm. So we had to wait for three years. So it's this waiting thing. And then when our son came to us, we were told on a Friday, my cat that I had with me for 15 years died that weekend. Oh, oh dear. and then on a Sunday, a crib shows up. And on Monday, this beautiful little boy, Roshan, comes into my house. So oh. when I tell you I was pretty freaked out, like oh, I've never yeah. done this before. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> delivers you a child, you know? Yeah. I felt like I explained to people it was like I popped out of bed every morning. Mm. And I don't know if you've ever waitressed or bartended, but for the first three or four months, I was in a low grade sweat the entire time. Yeah. Because I had a 22 month old child. Uh. And so, like, this apprehension of their needs and mm -hmm. what I needed to do to prepare my life for them. Gratefully, that weekend, I had my girlfriends who were mothers come over and go, Nope, that wire rack. Got to get rid of that. Nope. You see that? He'd pull it right down. So they went like around my house, like little whirling dervishes and helped me. My husband, like we, we pulled this bed out of the room that was going to be his room. Um, and my other girlfriend came, they started spackle and painting. I mean, mm. it was crazy. And I kept cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. And my girlfriend who was a mother said, Oh, Leslie, you're nesting. Because apparently a lot of pregnant mothers do that. Yeah. This cleaning thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I was doing things and I wasn't a pregnant mother, but I guess I'm like, it's not clean enough. You know, you're just like <laughs> scrubbing and scrubbing. And um, there was a lot of emotion behind it. I mean, so many emotions that, you know, what I do is whenever I see a mother, and especially if someone has more than one, I bow to you, Lise. <laughs> <laughs> I bow to you. Yeah, I do. You have three. I'm like, ah, I'm bowing three times <laughs> because it is so intense. It, yeah. It's, it's again, it's one of those things you can't explain it, right? Unless you go through it yourself. And that's right? yeah. very true. Very true. So yeah, yeah. but it's been it's so delightful. He is our joy. So I became a mama at fifty. Oh, wow. Congratulations. I did. I am a mid-century mama. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. That's awesome because I'm sure that, that he keeps you on your toes. He does. You know what? I have to give you I have to give you five uh, vows, and this is my virtual vows. I'm gonna have yes. to clap <laughs> because right, I get physically tired. Some days I feel like I'm run over and I'm in my third, <laughs> right? And so, <laughs> You have for you to be able to do this at age 50, you oh. are amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Amazing, right? Because yeah. I don't have the energy, right? Some days <laughs> I just think, oh my good lord. Well, and no, I just lose my eyes and I just think, oh. I am 54 now, so I look at it as like I could be a young grandmother. I mean, I could be, right? So yes. I yes, just look at it, Miss. He is keeping me young because, yeah. you know, yeah. I. Here's the other thing is I realized that my early years in being in this business, there's it's so deadline oriented. It is mm -hmm. so detail oriented that I would have been very frustrated and resentful because I wouldn't have been able to focus on the love of my work. So I am yeah. so grateful that I have these like, you know, 30 years under my belt. Yeah. I've won my awards. I have plenty of clients. And now this is a new adventure with this right. little guy. Yeah. And my work is shifting to continue yeah. to help creative people mm -hmm. and to continue to help them grow their business and create their great work. And I look at it as like a dual trajectory. Mm -hmm. So it's very exciting. It's like, I feel like that pressure is off. I don't have to prove yeah. it to myself. It's already yeah. been, already yeah. tasted that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 30 no so yeah. it, it i'm glad that it's happening now yeah so, so really this am. is your time this is your time yeah. it was meant yeah. to go through all those three years of waiting and everything because this is your time 
to not is. be able to pour into your son and do the things that are necessary without worrying about all the other stuff. Yes. Um, yeah, because I, I totally can can relate to the other stuff um, because I, I'm still, you know, heavily into the workforce. And um, since, since our son that I talk about in my book, uh, we have a daughter and she's four. And so she mm-hmm. definitely keeps us on our toes. You know, that, that age gap is interesting because you have one who is um, really, really independent and a four-year-old who, who tries to be just as independent. Um, but of course, you, you we have to kind of, you know, rein her in and make sure that she understands, okay, you can't do everything Big Brother is doing. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so I, that part, I, I totally um, am, am working to be where you are, Leslie, when I grow up um, in that <laughs> sense of, you know, separating um, from what I call sometimes the rat race um, and being able to still do meaningful things and and create and 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 help people and and you know pour into them but at the same time be able to take that time smell the roses with my with my family and yes do those things because that's important it that's, is important that's work that's important work it is no, it definitely. is before I kick you guys out because <laughs> I need to go enjoy the sunshine okay I can't be <laughs> when they start go right? outside <laughs> and play Exactly. So before I kick you guys out, right, there's just one thing I want to know, Les. Leslie, I hope you don't mind me calling you Les. <laughs> You've had this amazing life, right, you know, with your, little, with your son. And imagine if you were going to write about you, you know, your book, you know, write a book about your journey. How would you put all the emotions you're feeling out inside you know, out in your book cover, because I'm really, you know, because sometimes you see some book covers and you're, you know, you're scanning book covers because for me, I start scanning book covers and whichever one captures my eyes, that's where I stop. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Book covers. So what would you do to put all your emotions and how you're feeling in this book that you've written or you will write and make sure that it captures people's eyes? What would you do? Well, I could talk about that little ebook that I did. A, um, I have a, a phenomenal picture that was a photo that someone uh, had done for me with a giant big smile on my face. And you might have that photo as part of your the bio that I sent you. So okay, I, yeah. I used, I'm using that photo, which has a beautiful dark background. Um, it was done by a professional photographer in New York. Um, and his name is Dimitri. If anybody would like to know, he's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I used um, some painted paper that has been ripped. And my logo color is purple. So Mm -hmm. it's very graphic. You know, I have a red shirt, a black background, this Mm -hmm. purple ripped paper at the top where I could put a portion of the text and the rest of the text is in the background. Mm -hmm. And so it's just very impactful. It's very, you know, hot colors. It says the word mojo. And I think it just comes across as intense and also uplifting, which is, you know, pretty much sums up me. (laughs) I could just visualize it now. Dark, you know, I think it was the nice contrast of black and red. Yes. And the purple, a little bit of that purple. Yeah, I don't And a little bit of gold. You know, Ah. purple and the gold, some gold text, some white text. Mm. Um, Yes, and I've been still playing with the text for, I'm looking for something condensed and with a little energy to it, which I don't think I've quite found it. Um, But I keep playing with that for, you know, get your mojo back. And uh, I keep playing with that text. That's the one thing that I'm not quite satisfied with I have something there but I'm going to keep looking so as a designer you're always trying to tweak things and get them exactly like you'd like them mm-hmm. okay so before I kick you guys out if you would like to contact you how should I do so are you on the are you on the magic twitter or facebook any of those fine social places yes um this is Keisha Keith and I am on facebook um, you can find me under Keisha McCrory Keith, and the middle is um, M-C-C-R-O-R-E-Y. 
You can locate me on Twitter at LadyKK00. And the same for Instagram at LadyKK00. Fabulous. Do you have a website? I do. It is www.keishadkeith.com. Okay, I'm a bit confused. Did you say Mc, Mc something on Facebook? In the yes, my it it's my maiden name, McCrory. Ah, McCrory. So what is the D on your website? Oh, that's actually my that's my legal name. <laughs> Keisha D. Keith is what my uh, book is under, and uh, the D ah. stands for Danielle. That's my middle name. Ah, right. Because I got a bit confused. I was like McCrory, then D. Okay, fabulous. So yes. Keisha D. Keith. Right? Yes. Perfect. And how about you, Leslie? I'd like to first offer um, your people a complimentary Mojo Breakthrough Session, and they could schedule that by going to www.mojo.acuity, A-C-U-I-T-Y, scheduling.com. And that would be 50 minutes they would learn about what their creative work is in the world, what their challenges are, and what's holding them back from getting to where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And then if they'd like to contact me, they can do so at leslie at lesliennolandesign.com. And I can give them my free ebook, The Creative Entrepreneur's Guide to Get Your Mojo Back. They can go to my website. Uh, LeslieNolanDesign.com and this summer I'm going to be completely renovating it and they can also find me on Facebook or LinkedIn under Leslie Nolan. No Twitter? No, I'm not a Twitter person. Couldn't get into it. Since I've tried Instagram and I'm still struggling to get my head around it, well, I love Twitter. I find Twitter to be Twitter speaks to my heart, and I think I can understand because not, not everyone, not all social media uh, platforms, you know, is suitable for everyone. I have really mm -hmm. struggled with Instagram, but then I noticed that Lady KK, she's on Instagram. Yes, yes, I, I am, um, and I, I tend to post in there from time to time, but um, I also can uh, connect with other authors and, you know, other counselors and, and the like so that uh it provides that platform um for us wherein we don't necessarily in in the land of instagram we don't necessarily have to have to talk so much um and, and as we say certain things visually um through the the pictures or the memes mm -hmm. yeah oh, cool well please do connect with me my my um, instagram page needs a bit of loving because i've just not i'm struggling to get my head around it <laughs> If you can show me some love, um, it's Shekulala Salami. That would be absolutely fantastic. Beautiful. But ladies, it's been an absolute pleasure after I'm having you here, but I really do have to kick you out now. Sorry. Thank you so much for Thank the invitation. You. Go get your sunshine. Oh, yes. yay! And, and enjoy your watermelon <laughs> drink. I will. I will. <laughs> I will. Oh, can I tell you guys a secret that nobody knows? And I haven't really, you know, reminded a lot of my friends, but you, so you guys will be the first to hear. So tomorrow, I'm plus one. Ah, oh, that's cool. nice. So pray for me that the weather stays, because, you know, British weather, you can never trust it, right? It's looking amazing now, and then the sun god might be like, you know what, just because you want to have a barbecue, I'm going to go away. So just put uh, fingers on us. That is yeah. sunny on Saturday. But yes, I, I will. Yeah. Sure. You have Sending a happy your sunshine. Birthday. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies, until next time, see you on the Shagalala Salami Show, and thank you for stopping by again. Thank you, thank guys. You. Thank Have you. a wonderful weekend. Bye. Bye. And you too now. Bye.